Do I need this mic and also this mic? <laughs> Sorry, I need my phone to tweet. I have like so many mics, I feel like I'm on The Bachelorette right now. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> Uh, so good afternoon. I, I am so pleased to be here. I went for a run uh, this morning by the ocean. It was just unbelievable, totally beautiful. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the conference committee who pulled us together, especially George Chakas, who has been my contact while I've been here. Last night I arrived. I got to my hotel room. I was like, I would love to have a beer. I checked my email. George had emailed me where to go to get a beer. And then he emailed me the running path I should take this morning, and it was unbelievable. So big thanks to George and his team. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be back in Vancouver. I was here in April for the Gender and Sexuality and Information Studies Colloquium, which was co-hosted by Simon Fraser and Library Juice Press Litwin Books. It, was anyone here at that? Hi, wasn't that great? Yeah, I had such a good time. Um, and the weather, this weather is better than that weather. Um, I was one of the organizers for that one-day event, so I have really recent experience with how much work it takes to pull off an event like this one. I'm really grateful for the labor of George and Aaron and everyone for the work that went into making today a day where I could stand here in the forests of Western Canada as a real gift, so thank you. It's also a gift to be invited... Am I hitting the mic? Yeah, okay. It's also a gift to be invited to talk about whatever I want. <laughs> that is... Uh, such incredible freedom. And when I sent George a short abstract for today's talk, he said it all looked fine, except the committee just wanted to be sure I would be talking about instruction in library use, because that's the, <laughs> <laughs> the theme for the conference today. Uh, that is the ostensible reason we've all made this trip to Vancouver. So my interest as an instruction librarian is in the tools that we use, and so that's what I'd like to talk about today. I'm not a cataloger, but I use the work of catalogers each day. Cataloging and classification is at the core of the library project. This is my first of two conundrums that um, I'm going to be exploring today. Um, it's at the core of the library project, the difference between a big pile of books uh, just sitting on the floor somewhere and a collection that I can browse, search, and retrieve from. I see my position as a teaching librarian as standing between that catalog and the students I serve. And I think it's our task to engage the catalog critically and to teach our students to learn how to use it, too. Just keep going, Chris says. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> I did feel like over I was like, they can't need to hear me this loudly. OK. Um, where am I? So I feel like that might feel a bit retro. And I'll look forward to, if you guys have feedback on that, it might completely retro in my uh, sort of old-time bibliographic instruction approach that maybe has no place in a time of linked open data and algorithmic retrieval. Who uses the catalog anymore anyway? Well, I think librarians do. I think our students do also. And more than that, I think that teaching students how to use the catalog can itself be a kind of critical intervention in teaching about information retrieval and use of all kinds. Even more, I think teaching the catalog can be a way to teach about power, dominance, sameness, difference, hegemony, and resistance more broadly. That's a really big claim. And it's one that I look forward to unpacking with you over the next half an hour or 40 minutes or so. So as teaching librarians, I think it's our task to introduce our students to knowledge organization structures that enable inquiry and curiosity in the library. That's like my passion. I was on the airplane with a bunch of cruisers, was the term that they had for themselves. They're cruisers going to Alaska. And they asked me what I was going to be talking about. And I said, teaching the library catalog. And yeah, they're like, mm. <laughs> like one of them put, pulled her, she really, she pulled her night mask down. <laughs> I am very passionate about it, and I think you guys are also, right? For many of us, teaching these systems also means teaching languages and logics we might otherwise contest. And Aaron and I were talking about this just before I started, right? Like, I teach you how to use a thing, but at the same time, uh, I feel a little anxious about it. We teach students that controlled terms allow you to retrieve all books on a given topic in an OPAC. Right? That's the real value of the catalog. But we're also critical of the idea that there is one correct way of describing something, and that every other way of describing things is wrong. We teach students that materials about gay men and lesbians can be found in the HQ 76 section, which is really true, right? Uh, but we are critical of the idea that homosexuality is a social problem. This, to me, is the central conundrum of teaching in libraries. In order to help students effectively access information resources held in our collections, I have to teach them how to use systems I'd simultaneously like them to challenge and that I'd like to be challenging myself. 
We're not the only people in the university facing the tension between assimilation into existing structures of power, right? Like, come and learn how this works and just comply with it, and the desire to transform those structures. So here are a couple of other examples of that. I'm thinking of current debates around diversity and inclusion that contest a simple enfolding of people of color into a white hegemonic space. David James Hudson and others have argued that diversity initiatives that are simply about hiring people of color risk simply reproducing white ways of knowing and being, leaving structures of white supremacy intact. So April Hathcock has this article where she writes about hiring black people, but they have to act white in order to be hired, right? I have issues with the way she frames that that we can talk about at the refreshment break. Okay. Um, another talk. <laughs> Charlotte Rowe has explored similar tensions in scholarly communications, arguing that the concentration of white people at every single stage of the publication process, the editors, the peer reviewers, the publishers, means that publishing will remain white, even if nominally more people of color are included as authors. These always strike me as intractable problems. Sure, we need to change the system. We need a revolution, right? But what about people of color right now? How do we make positive change for real people living right now who need jobs in libraries and our students who need to be served by representatives, but by people who look like them, right? While simultaneously addressing systemic and structural problems that work against equity and social justice. I actually think teaching students to use the catalog can help us get there. In part, that's because the catalog is a text with material implications. I think this is one of the lucky things about being a librarian. They're material, everything we think about is material. There's like almost nothing abstract about our work, right? So the, the catalog is a text that orders and describes things according to a single dominant logic. Because it does that, we can see it quite easily once we train ourselves and our students to look at the ways that what might appear natural, normal, fixed once and for all, that those things are actually subject to change. As librarians, we make and remake systems of power every time we select, acquire, classify, catalog, and teach someone to search and retrieve using those systems. It's quite a lot of power to hold in our hands, and I think it's important that we think about how that power works, conceptualize it, and critique it so that we can use that librarian power for good. So I want to begin, begin like <laughs> in my talk it says I want to begin, and I'm like, I've been talking for 10 minutes. All right, so I want to continue talking a little bit more about cataloging and classification, two functions of the library I see at the core of everything we do. As I talk, I'd like us to think together about how libraries function as a kind of analog for all the kinds of things in the world that take masses of things and people and produce order out of them, according to structures that maybe appear natural. So I flew here from New York yesterday, I connected through Toronto. Everybody hates that airport, right? <laughs> yeah, the security was like... So it, the person examining the bag, this little <laughs> digress, the person examining the bag was taking like four minutes to examine each bag, but people were passing through the gate every 30 seconds, and then it was just like this traffic jam. And then they asked me at the end if I wanted to take a little survey about it, and I was like, yes, <laughs> I do. So I think that you're about to see some big changes at the Pearson Airport. <laughs> you're totally welcome. Anyway, so I fly through, I connect through Toronto. When we arrived in Toronto, we were sorted. Canadian and U.S. passport holders to the left, others to the right. I think there were stories about power in that moment, who counts as suspicious, who is assumed to be a friend. But the airport might also claim, and rightly so, that that sorting was for a neutral reason that was about efficiency and pre-negotiated agreements at the level of the state. Both can be true at the same time. It can be simultaneously easier for everyone to sort passengers in that way, but also kind of messed up to do that. In libraries, as at the airport, ordering systems are essential. We can't live without them. Without them, a library is just a pile, a mass, a chaos, a jumble of books that we would each need to pick through one by one every time we wanted to find a new book were it not for the magic of the catalog. Classification schemes and controlled vocabularies are ways into a collection. They carve it up in order to make it accessible, much the way maps like make land navigable, right? So George emails me that I should take the Spanish trail, Spanish beach trail. Did anybody run that this morning also? There were like 800 runners. It's like, <laughs> I was worried that I would be like scared. And then I got out there and I was like, well, we're all running here. Anyway, so he told me Spanish Trail, right? But I needed like three or four different maps to keep myself from getting lost, and I still got lost. Um, right, so we need the, the map to make land navigable so we aren't charting a new path every time we go out for a walk. In the library, our ordering systems reflect the ways that some of us perceive the world, sorting knowledge into the categories we see outside of us. And because these systems become the field against which other kinds of knowledge are made, 
right, as people use that system to search, find, retrieve, and build new knowledge. Whoever made that has great, like, has great influence over the kinds of things it's possible to make and know. Does that make sense? Okay. This separates our ordering schemes from the loose groupings of rocks and marbles and baseball cards in my eight-year-old's drawers. Right? I asked him, like, what kind of kids do you have in your class? And he told me, like, 18 different ways, right? Like, they're, they're the short to tall, they're the... He, he doesn't understand gender yet, and I don't think it's because he's growing up in a lesbian family, but it's very weird. It's like gender was not a way he separated the kids. But anyway, so he's got like all of these different sort of imaginary schemes in his head. They have no power, right? Because he's a baby, he has no power. Our ordering schemes, though, are coupled with power. They matter a lot, right? They make it possible for other people to find things, and they channel the ways that they find those things into the sort of ideas that we have. They also enact a fantasy that there is a single stable order that we can apply to the stuff that comes out of our heads. I think this fantasy of a single way of seeing is in tension with other ways of understanding knowledge that I find more personally resonant and more useful in a teaching context. So the theory, sort of theoretical background I'm going to be using um, is to frame sort of knowledge making with a queer theoretical perspective that troubles ideas about the world that privilege fixity, stability, and a single point of view, the things that we privilege in the library. I think thinking and teaching from a queer perspective offers us a way to both teach students to navigate fixed structures while simultaneously revealing those structures as subject to resistance and change. And I'm always thinking as I think about libraries, which is why I love working in libraries, about other contexts where elaborate and normalizing classification structures enable access to some things while foreclosing other possibilities. I'm thinking about medicine where we often have to describe a set of symptoms in a particular way in order to get the care that we need. Or the DMV, where we have to demonstrate certain kinds of capacities and produce certain kinds of forms so that we can gain the right to drive. Or airports, where knowing the patterns of law regarding shoes and liquids and court plastic bags are necessary if we want to make it to our gate on time. I didn't have to take my shoes off at security in Toronto. But like half the people had their shoes off, so I didn't know if I was supposed to take my shoes. Am I supposed to take my <laughs> shoes off in Canada? Oh, no. OK. All right. Um, but I did have to put my suitcase in a bin. So in the U.S. airport, you don't have to put your suitcase in a bin. So that was confusing, too. And then there were, like, two rows of bins. It was, like, very confusing. I was glad that I had two hours to figure it out, you know? <laughs> and I, you know, I'm, like, pretty efficient. You know, like, I'm an efficient rule follower. It's, like, part of being a librarian. And I, felt, I always feel proud of that. But then I was at the airport. And I was like, this whole system doesn't make sense to me, even though it's, like, a pretty mild difference. It still was, like, I have a lot of anxiety. Anyway. Um, so I'm interested in talking about some of those other contexts and how this analysis might apply. So I'm glad we get to spend the next couple days together. So a quick refresher about cataloging and classification in, some of, in case some of you, like me, haven't thought much about technical services since library school. So the project of a library is to collect the sum of human knowledge to organize it and make it accessible to users. If we think about, about it, that is a really fantastic project that's truly wild in its scope. Let's collect everything and fit it all into a single ordering system. That ordering system consists of two parts, classification and cataloging. I super know this because I wrote an article and the peer review came back and it said, cataloging and classification are two different things and this writer doesn't know that and she needs to know that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, I really, really know. Um, <laughs> classification is the process of grouping like things with like collating materials so that you can go to one part of the shelf, find a single book on women's history, find all the other books on women's history in the same location. right? Classification makes the library shelves browsable. Cataloging is different from classification. That's the way those items are described using a controlled vocabulary. Librarians select and standardize a language so that all books about marijuana, whether you call it weed, grass, blunts, ganja, loud, was the term that I used to learn this semester for my students. Whatever word you use, they're all pulled together in the catalog. And that makes the library collection accessible. Without those two things, the library is just a random pile of books. I use a lot of different kinds of metaphors to think about these knowledge organization structures. They're wedges, doorways, ladders, steps. They're what makes it possible to climb a mountain, gain purchase on the side of an egg, right? I think without it, you just like, I'm imagining myself climbing a giant egg. It just wouldn't work. So I think those two things help us access the sum of human knowledge. They leave us also with conundrum number two. They reflect a set of values that librarians hold dear, values that we might, might want to contest in other areas of our life and work. And the value in the library, we really value order. And for me, order has two different parts. First, librarians value fixity. 
by which I mean not like a thing that is fixed, but like it can't move, right? Um, once a book is placed somewhere, we don't move it. Once we label it with a subject heading, we don't change that word, right? We want knowledge to stay in one place. I know that there's some pushback because like it's 2016 and couldn't I cascade a change through the OPAC, right? Couldn't I just like change, what did they do, elderly to aged or the other way around or something and just like hit a button and have the change cascade. But I think it's really the reality of labor conditions mean that you can't do that. It's like what kind of, what amount of work is really possible in a time of shrinking cataloging departments and the outsourcing of search and retrieval to vendors. We lost a cataloger, she moved to Hong Kong. Guess what we did not do? Hire another cataloger, right? I mean, are you guys seeing your tech, tech services shrink? Yeah, like who's gonna do that one button push thing, right? I think the context of a corporate cost-saving university means more generic metadata than ever. And even if a library had a thousand catalogers, it's difficult to imagine a scenario where we could be constantly be updating thesauri and reorganizing collections while keeping up with the influx of new materials. And while maybe you can push a button and cascade a subject heading change in the OPAC, how many of you have been involved in a shifting project? Probably not something that we're going to do um, a whole lot, um, if we can help it. Or we'll do it when I'm on sabbatical. Maybe. <laughs> so I think we value fixity in part because of efficiencies. Right? Some of the bad kinds that are required by the neoliberal university, as well as the good kind that mean we aren't inventing the wheel every single time we go out for a bike ride. The second thing I think we value is control. Like always, I'm always, like librarianship is really kind of Fifty Shades territory, right? We really value control. Every item in a bibliographic universe is subject to bibliographic control, no matter where it comes from or how different it might be from the dominant vocabularies and categories in our system of control. Everything must be disciplined into our classification structures and named using our controlled vocabularies if it is to exist in our collections at all. Yeah, you have a special collection that has its own language, right? But it does, everything has to fit within the system. That's part of what makes the library work. It produces no outside. In libraries, nothing escapes capture by our knowledge organization schemes. This all sounds rather grim and nasty, I think, right? Like, Stop doing that, right? But I think the will to dominance is accompanied by this idea of hospitality. This is the idea that classification and cataloging structures are flexible enough that anything can find a home inside of them. After all, we require you to find a home here, but we also make a home for you here, right? That's the flip side of that. And a good knowledge organization system is a hospitable one. It's why people prefer the 21 class divisions of Library of Congress to the 10 divisions in Dewey. With 21 potential places to pull and grow and stretch, you're sure to find a home there while finding a place inside Dewey can be much harder. I think about the, I've worked in a public library for my first job. I lasted 10 months. It's really high stress work in uh, New York, probably everywhere, but New York is tough. Um, and that 000 section was just like everything. It was like computers, jet planes, robots, right? Not hospitable. Even the most hospitable system though requires that knowledge be disciplined into an existing structure. So the problem is that these systems are made by people. Guess who those people are? Right? There are people who usually have power to make decisions about what goes where and what we name it. And that results in some problems with the order of things, which is what I'd like to talk about next. Um, how familiar are people with the work of Sandy Bourbon? OK. OK, so maybe this, this will be new to some of us. So in the late 1960s and 1970s, Sanford Berman, a US librarian working at the University of Zambia, found that his Zambian users had a very different relationship to the term kafirs than US users did, kafirs being a controlled vocabulary term to describe uh, people from Zambia. It was simply descriptive in the US context to US catalogers, but it was virulently racist in Zambia. So the idea that language has meaning only in context, uh, which is an idea that is articulated abstractly in fields like philosophy, comparative literature, and anthrop anthropology, is very, it's like a very material problem in the library, right? The, the word itself turns people off from using the catalog. Subject headings, which were often cast by catalogers as a kind of pure objective language, and I always think about like, that's how coders think about their language too, as pure and objective. How is it not pure and objective? I have no idea, but I would love to know. Um, anyway, so that pure objective language, it really isn't pure and objective. Where and when and by whom subject headings are used makes all the difference in terms of meaning. Berman's insight, one shared by other catalog 
catalogers, including A.J. Foskett, Steve Wolf, and Joan Marshall in the 1970s. Joan Marshall wrote a book about the, a women's thesaurus, I think it's called. Gosh, it's all feminist language. Um, and K.R. Roberto, Jenna Friedman, Amber Billy, Violet Fox, and others today was one that changed the cataloging landscape in the United States for good. Mobilized by petitions to the Library of Congress, missives in library journals and newsletters, and organized responses within ALA, um, subject headings began to be troubled and changed. And I'm interested particularly in the way that they were troubled and changed around gender and sexual identities. The first program of the ALA Task Force on Gay Liberation was called Sex in the Single Cataloger. It was a session about the trouble with headings for gay and lesbian materials. Librarians since the 1970s have made it their business to critically read subject headings for bias, arguing often successfully for changing subject headings to ameliorate that bias and altering classification structures to fix the ideological stories told by the classification scheme. And we'll look at a couple of examples in a minute. Librarians have convincingly made the case that Library of Congress classification and the Library of Congress subject headings fail to accurately and respectfully organize library materials about social groups and identities that lack social and political power. So librarians have worked hard to correct incorrect classification decisions, and they've argued for the expansion and correction of subject headings. The critical cataloging movement has addressed the problem of bias in these structures primarily as a functional issue. Right? Materials are cataloged incorrectly. They could be cataloged correctly with the correct pressure from activist catalogers who are good people who know better. Right? And I think this project has meaningfully pointed out the trouble with classification and cataloging decisions that are framed as objective and neutral, calling attention to the fundamentally political project of sorting materials into categories and then giving those categories names. Right? It's always a political decision every time you decide where a book is going to go and how you're going to describe it. I don't think any of us, there, you, there's no way out of that problem, though, which is where I think teaching librarians come in. It's like, I'm really sure I'm right most of the time, right? Um, but if I was in charge of the catalog, A, a bunch of you would disagree with me, and you, you are right-thinking people also, and B, in 50 years, I'm going to look absurd, and I don't know how, but I'm assuming that like some way I thought about animals or people or land or resources or something, right? Like, if we're all underwater, why was Emily so concerned about gender when like <laughs> right like I'm gonna look I'm gonna look ridiculous in 50 years and I think that's like an intractable problem right so critical cataloging calls attention to that problem but I don't think it solves it I think that's where we come in so I want to look at a few examples uh, just concretely of what these dominant knowledge organization structures do to those of us who sit outside or against structures that Sandy Berman has called this parochial Jingoistic Europeans and North Americans, white-hued, nominally Christian, Protestant in faith, comfortably situated in the middle and higher income brackets, right? This is who Sandy Berman says is making those cataloging decisions, and this leaves out a bunch of us. Okay. So a set of problems that I see. Okay. First, so these are my four examples. I'm, I wish I was like better at slides and had like a visual sense, but I'm like... Times New Roman, 12-point type kind of person. Um, thank you for <laughs> sticking with me. OK, so first, classification requires physical objects to live in one and only one place on library shelves. Now, I know that you could have like multiple keywords in a, sh in, a, in a catalog, right? And you can surface materials in lots of ways in a digital context. But when it comes to browsing and going to the shelf, the book is a physical thing. It has to live in one place. I wonder if that's going to look absurd in 50 years. It's going to be like, I can't believe Emily thought the thing could only live one place, right? We're in a fifth dimension where everything can move. Anyway, um, so I think this can result in some strange separations. So for example, David Wanarovich, do people know his work at all? He's a New York City artist, poet, writer, filmmaker, and AIDS activist in the 1980s. He's an iconic figure in LGBTQ communities. He's known for his incendiary art and writing that confronts sex, race, and class and the abandonment by the state of people sick and dying from AIDS. He was the, sort of the guy who started the, the political funeral idea, which is when someone, was, someone died of AIDS, that was a disease that was preventable by the state. The state's refusal to uh, invest in uh, a cure for HIV and AIDS meant that they were responsible for that death, and he would parade, they would parade bodies through the streets, right? So, like, a big deep guy. So in the library classification scheme, his book, Memories That Smell Like Gasoline, which is like this sort of 
car wreck of a book that's totally beautiful, um, is shelved at RC 607, the section in the, in the classification for immunologic diseases, right? So all the complexity and wildness and politics of his life and art and political work is reduced to his illness when he enters the library. The second problem, I think, is that classification decisions reflect ideological decisions. So this is subclass HQ. Okay. The family, marriage, women, okay? They're reduced to their role in marriage. There are apparently no men in families, which, you know, <laughs> a little true of my families, but whatever. Um, <laughs> But we see also, right, so women are reduced to marriage, and then we also see um, which sexualities get marked and which don't. So it's very hard to search for heterosexuality, their sexual life. I guess that's 12 through 440. Well, I don't know, where, where are heterosexuals here, right? Like, are they, is heterosexuality reduced to the family? I don't know, that seems grim. Um, <laughs> so we can't find heterosexuality, but the deviant sexualities are very clear to see, right? Here are men and women dating over here in 801, but homosexuality is not about dating. It's more like bestiality, right, um, and, and sexual deviation, right? So maybe there's a political argument about that, right? Like, I do want to push back against that analysis. It's like, well, I, it's not bestiality, because it's like, well, what if it was, right? Like, what if all sexuality was like sexuality, right? We didn't, you know, sort of assign it this deviance sort of frame. Right, but it is interesting to see what ideology this reflects. So the critical cataloger comes in and is like, well, let's change this and move things around, right? But for me, I see this and I'm like, oh, that's resonant with my own experience of the world, right? Like, so I'm actually kind of grateful to see a text just telling me straight out that I never go on dates. <laughs> no, but you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> telling me that, that, that the society doesn't see my sexuality as legitimate. The third problem, I think, is the third problem is that only some of us are marked by cataloging language, which is another issue that I have with the cataloging for correctness kind of problem, right? It's like always proliferating language around lesbians and gay men. And I'm like, well, how about we proliferate language around gay people for straight people for a change, right? Like, why not, why not mark them? So if you look at the authority record for women United States, you can see lots and lots of women listed there, right? So women United States, Idaho, say, where I'm born, uh, where I was born but we never see white women marked in the catalog. You can, so you can't search for white women as a thing that exists in the world. You can search the subject heading Women White, which retrieves materials that explicitly address whiteness, but all of those books that are about a universal woman who is white are not marked as such, right? So you can't retrieve information in that way. They still masquerade as about women generally, as if they weren't raced. So one of my first experiences as a teaching librarian was working with an African-American women's history class at Sarah Lawrence College in Yonkers, New York. After discussing the fact that in the library one has, in our library, right, remember how you just like change the heading, you push a button and it cascades the change through the OPAC? Does not actually do that, right? That never works, right? Um, so in our library we still had headings for African-American women, black women, Afro-American women, and even Negro women. So you had to search all four of those you had to literally search four times as hard to retrieve all the information um, about African-American women. A student asked, how would I retrieve all the books about white women? And my boss at the time, who I was shadowing, said, just search for white women, right? was her cheerful response. And that's really only part of the story. Only some people are marked in the world, right? And, and it's the same in the catalog. It's a reflection of the world that we inhabit, and I kind of like that it's made really plain and clear in the catalog. Um, the fourth example of, of problematic subject headings is recently the librarians, um, librarians were pushing the Library of Congress to eliminate the subject heading illegal aliens. Did you guys follow along on this debate, right? On the grounds that it's dehumanizing and pejorative. This was a case where even the proposed correction, which then the government pushed back against, is so absurd, um, was a decision to replace illegal aliens with non-citizens. That was the Library of Congress decision. Um, so that's a word that describes people by what they're not. How different it would be if the language was like people facing terrible choices produced by states that will deny their role in producing those conditions, right? Like what if that was the heading, right? Or even undocumented immigrants, which was the language critical catalogers were pushing for. 
And then, of course, the U.S. Republican congressmen fought back to keep the language of illegal aliens in the catalog, a reminder that any of the t decisions that we make at our scale are also subject to control by forces, forces larger than us. I think that's a different paper. And yeah, maybe I'll write that next. So I think that the work activist catalogers do to change and fix all of these issues is vital and important. It's done much to remove aggressions, micro and macro, from our catalogs. But no matter what language we use, we are always fitting things into classification and cataloging structures that demand fixity and control. It's inescapable. And there's that conundrum again. We can change the insides of our systems all we want, but that doesn't change the way the system fundamentally works. It disciplines and orders things into fixed structures of control. It's harder, I think, to imagine our way into a new set of ladders, bridges, grids, or maps that would reflect the range of ways of knowing and being that we'd like to see centered in our collections. So what do we do, right? We're such a pre prescriptivist profession, right? We're always looking for answers for what to do. And I feel like I always want to pause for a minute and be like, let's stop telling each other what to do for a minute, you know? But I think it's because we're doers, right? And, and while I'm hesitant to offer answers, uh, I would like to offer a sort of queer way of thinking about knowledge organization structures that I think can help us rethink stable, fixed categories and systems of naming that characterize library knowledge organization schemes and help us develop some strategies for navigating them. So this is a quick and dirty queer theory. It's not that hot, actually. Um, queer theory, I think, like library classification schemes, and why I think they're provocative to put together is because both are preoccupied with questions of identity and difference, but in slightly different ways, right? What sits together and what sits apart, and how is power attached to those things? In this context, I think of identity as meaning it's a word that means how the self understands the self, and then how the self relates that self to others. We all have multiple and intersecting identities. I'm a librarian, a runner, a woman, a white person, a lesbian, a US citizen. Some of these identities are coupled with power in relation to structures of gender, race, class, and others. The intersections my identity is with power the intersection of my identities with power produce my experience of and perspective on the world, in particular gendered, raced, and class ways, right? Like, so I go out for a run, and I think, I think my woman identity produces a fear, right? And it made me stay in bed a little later. Well, there were other reasons that I was lounging and drinking coffee, but, you know, it made me not want to go out so early because I was a little bit scared, you know? And I don't think if I was a man, I would have that same fear. So it's produced by the structure. So identity is not simply, though, about my internal experience. It's also social and socially constructed and socially experienced. So by this, I mean that my identity, when articulated to others, enables me to enter into a social life, which I enjoy. I understand myself to be an instruction librarian. And when I tell others that I'm an instruction librarian, I connect with them if they share this identity. Like, the cruisers did not care <laughs> at all. But I think that you guys care, you know? And they cared that each other was cruisers, right? They didn't know if there was any, is there any food to eat at the airport? Was there a debate at the waiting area? I was like, it's the airport, yes. Anyway, <laughs> we're not very good at cruising. Um, anyway, so, so now we're connecting because we share that identity. And then we get together as instruction librarians and we talk about instruction librarian things, and it's good, right? Identity is good. Um, it enables certain kinds of uh, social life. So in queer theory, we talk about identity as socially constructed, contingent, and contested. Okay, these are the sort of three ideas that I'll, I'll put forth. First, gender and sexuality are socially constructed. From a queer theory frame, gender and sexuality are not immutable characteristics that you are born with once and for all, but instead are created as we live in a world that requires us to define these things in certain ways. Right? I don't think that there's an a priori reason why a certain part of your body should determine so much of your social existence, but we can't deny that it does. The first question asked of new parents is, is it a girl or a boy? Right? There are laws in place about who can use what bathroom based on gender identity. This is a huge issue in the United States right now. It's like, it's just peeing, right? But it means everyone is required by law to have a gender that they perform and admit to in public. And I think one can imagine a world where that wasn't true, where we organized on the basis of something else. Second, I think that identities are contingent. The way we experience and describe them depends deeply on context. When I came out to my mother, I told her I was a lesbian. But we all called ourselves queer back then, and if you called yourself a lesbian, it meant you were not cool, right? <laughs> you were not, there was like, there wasn't, there, you, your identity lacked a political valence, and we probably shouldn't go out, right? 
Um, so it just totally depended on who I was talking to, what identity I used. I told the butchers I was interested in that I was femme, right? I would never have said that to my mother, right? She would have been like, what are you talking about? She was so sad that I couldn't have kids. That was like her big issue. Now I have a kid who she never comes to visit. Anyway, um, so I think who we're talking to makes... All, a huge difference, all the difference in terms of how we describe ourselves and what meaning is produced by that description. Identity is also contested and negotiated. They're never settled questions. And I'm going to give you a Judith Butler quote that I think comes in handy here, and I'll, I think it's valuable. So, um, but it's a little dense. Not dense. Maybe it's poorly written. I don't know. <laughs> we have a couple days together, right? Is she, is she dense or complex? I don't know. Uh, to claim that this is what I am is to suggest a provisional totalization of this I. But if the I can so determine itself, then that which it excludes in order to make that determination remains constitutive of the determination itself, right? So when I claim an identity, it produces something that is not me, that is just as much a part of who I am as the thing that I've laid claim to, right? So anytime, so if I say I'm a lesbian, I'm not that kind of lesbian, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a queer kind or a this or that kind, right? So to claim a name is to produce something outside of that name. It's a setup of a kind, I think, because now there is this excess identity that I can lay claim to or that others can. I imagine if I come out as a lesbian, if I say I'm a lesbian, I imagine someone else might say, oh, I am a lesbian too, but not the kind that Emily is, and now we have an identity that's contested, right? Concretely, I think of the movement to legalize gay marriage in the United States, which has led some of my friends who identify as queer we grew up queer together to get married, right? To say we stand against norms of gender and sexuality and yet we would like to register our sexual relationship with the state. It's like absurd to me, right? Um, because for me, queer has always meant resistance to normative categories like married. So in the contemporary moment, the word queer takes on something quite different from what it meant to queer nation when they claimed it as a politicized word in, the 19, in 1990, right? So the language is contested all the time. So these are different ways to think about those fixed categories in the, in the catalog. So if identity is constructed, contingent, and contested, how can we square it with structures that fix things in a single location once and for all? So queer, the queer theoretical, queer theory analytic locates the trouble with library classification and cataloging in the project of fixity itself. As we attempt to contain entire fields of knowledge or ways of being in accordance with universalizing systems and structures, we invariably cannot account for knowledges or ways of being that are excess to those systems. Can't be done. We have room for men or women or even transgender people, but we have less room for identities that A, fall outside of those divisions, and B, I think, are produced by those divisions, for ways of enacting gender that we might not even be able to imagine yet. Our systems are hospitable in that anything is welcome and indeed required to find a home, but this hospitality requires that anything that enters our libraries will be disciplined into the structures that we've already built. These queer theoretical perspectives on cataloging and classification challenge the idea that a stable, universal, objective, knowledge organization system could even exist, even if good people made it. There's no such thing if categories and names are always contingent and in motion. So when we attempt to correct classification and cataloging, move David Wanarovich books to a part of the classification that better reflects what matters to him, or move books to what I think matters about him, right? Um, and I'm just me. Right? or move books about transsexuality outside of the classification section for pathologies and into the classification section for social understandings of gender, um, something that also happens and has happened in the library I've been in. There, there are simply examples of other instances, our own, of categorical production, doing the same kind of work that LC classification and cataloging decisions do every single time, and they're just a subject to critique from different contingent positions. They don't, however, do much to change or challenge the hegemony that lies at the heart of the knowledge organization project in the first place. In fact, I think the political focus on correcting classification structures and subject headings solidifies the idea that the classification structure is in fact objective or could be, that it does in fact tell the truth. I think these are the core fictions that allow the hegemony of universalized classification structures to persist. When gay and lesbian materials are classified under sexual deviance, the knowledge organization structure tells one kind of true story. Gay men and lesbians are sexually deviant, a dominant ideological truth reflected in, for example, the systemic, systematic denial to gay men and lesbians of the social goods acquired by those with normative sexuality through marriage. Right? So that's a problem. 
the user confronting the perhaps initially shocking and upsetting placement of materials here might be encouraged to think critically about the classification and cataloging structure. After all, if Elsie thinks about gay men and lesbians in this way, what else does it get terribly consequentially wrong? Such incorrectness reveals ruptures in the otherwise seamless objectivity that the classification pretends to. Erasing that rupture, smoothing it over by correcting it, erases the evidence of dominant ideology and the resistance to it that are essential components of the cataloging and classification project. But then, despite these problems, we can't do without classification and cataloging. Right? That's the, like the conundrum that occupies my whole life. Right? You have a big pile of books, has to be organized somehow. We could change the language of the categories to center the things we value the most. I'm sure many of us would do a better job. Um, but if we're going to make that giant pile of books accessible, we'll have to build a way in. And whatever way we build in, the structure will reflect the ideologies of the builders. So what does this say to us about our lives as teaching librarians? There have been lots of sort of ideas for how to solve and resolve the problem. Changing subject headings. Hope Olson, do people know her work? Totally fabulous, right? She argues that uh, a couple of things. First, that you could have local cataloging and classification schemes that represent the context, right? There's no reason you have to have a big universal sort of system. We could develop them on a local level. She also has a great idea of varying citation order inside of the catalog so that things get, because another issue is like which, which same thing do you emphasize in the catalog? And she advocates sort of rotating the thing that you emphasize. Um, people have argued for user tagging that lets users build the classification a little bit. Right? I can put my own language into the catalog. I don't think that's like viable because I don't want to do that. I just want to find the book, right? So I think like, <laughs> you know, first. And second, normal people don't think like librarians. They're not thinking about other people in the future, right? So the most, I think, this may be apocryphal by now, but at one time, the most popular tag on Flickr was what? Me, right? <laughs> <laughs> So that's why I think user tagging has like limited utility for solving the problem. Amber Billy and others are busily trying to convince me that linked open data offers a way out. It's like a whole new way of thinking about materials organization. I see some nodding. I'm not sure, right? Um, and I've, I've yet to really understand it, right? So the argument is that instead of determining a structure in advance, identity is based on webs of association um, that don't have to sort of pool around one term that a librarian has picked out. I do think all of these are technical solutions to what's a social and political problem, a conundrum of social life, right? And one that we might productively teach about as we work with students in the classroom, at the reference desk, and in consultation as they endeavor to find what they are looking for. I think we can exploit the ground laid by queer theory for understanding classification structure and subject language as contextual, as contingent, as discursively produced and invite people who use our catalogs and indexes into that discourse. Okay, that's not to say that like I'm gonna sit down and talk to you about Sandy Berman when you're just like needing three evidence-based practice peer-reviewed articles for your paper, right? <laughs> but I do think that the problems that you're gonna run into when trying to translate your own language into the language of the catalog, give me a chance to make that intervention. Say, so is there a reason that you think, like there's a reason that your language, the language that's not the language of power, is not, you know, you're, it's not working, right? And that's because the system is set up kind of for you um, to either change yourself or fail, right? So I think a queerly informed teaching librarian has the potential to transform these moments in the library use process into another point where the ruptures of classification and cataloging can be productively pulled apart to help users understand the bias of hegemonic schemes. For example, a user seeking information about identities that are not listed in LCSH, for example, genderqueer or aggressive, could be led in a gen to the general point in the classification where related materials could be found and engage in a discussion of why the knowledge they come seeking by name is invisible in the structure. Like I work at a health sciences campus, honestly, this example is never happening to me. It's those evidence-based practice articles. It's like, why can't I find anything in, you know, translating? That problem of translation is one that I think is resonant um, a lot. Such a reference interaction would both usefully direct the student to relevant materials, which is like, I think power sharing of the first degree, right? I've got to get you in access to the system that works for you, um, while also exploiting the contextual cues offered by LCSH. 
I think librarians who are themselves engaged with a sort of queer approach to knowledge organization can teach the user how to understand what she sees when she searches the OPAC and what she doesn't, as directly related to the structure of the knowledge organization system she searches against. When we talk to people who want to find things in our collections, we can point them to the problems and help them strategically negotiate around them. That's what we do all the time, right? To find what they need. But I think it's useful, right? Because it is, after all, useful to know that materials about queer lives are reduced to the general headings like gay men, both in order to find things and to think about ways that such a reduction happens in other parts of social life. The OPAC, after all, is not the only place where gay men run into trouble. We might not feel that language represents us well, but knowing how to manage our needs in the face of systems that were not built for us is the kind of work that many of us have to do all the time. In the library, we have to learn how to do that critically as we go about our business of making knowledge or passing tests or getting a grade on our paper. Right? It's like a real gift for those of us who are sort of critical, critically minded in our instruction. Rather than thinking of the problem of integrating different ways of knowing into our catalogers as a technical services problem, I think of it as a public service problem one that librarians can be aware of and then teach students about at the reference desk and in the classroom. So that's my claim. I'm cognizant of the time. But I'm sure some of you are thinking, yeah, but who uses subject headings anyway, right? How many of us start our research at the library catalog and we all just Google everything? Even I sort of just Google everything, right? I'm starting a new project. Guess where I started? Google, right? Um, so I want to close with a brief discussion, I think, of how, because I think there's real value in the text. That's the claim that I hope is resonant to some of you. Google works differently to retrieve things. It doesn't use the kinds of classification structures that we use in libraries, but that doesn't mean it isn't using something, right? The difference is we can't tell how it's organizing things. How does Google organize information? By what principles do I retrieve what I retrieve? Google will tell you broadly that retrieval is based on content, factors. I'm going to show you just like a, has anybody looked at how they explain it on their website? Algorithms, is how search works according to Google, right? Scroll to see the story. It's like beautiful <coughs> in a very Google way, right? Like here's this web and a bunch of big numbers. You know, I scroll and things happen. Right? String theory, wow, right? <laughs> We write programs and formulas, right? Like what I like about LC is that I know exactly how it's working, right? I know exactly why I'm retrieving what I'm retrieving. But programs and formulas that work is ostensibly what Google is doing, right? They're doing this thing, right? There's like a robot arm and like, <laughs> there's like a search lab that looks like a house, I don't know, right? So this is like how Google explains how, you know, <laughs> we fight spam to keep our, like, the problem with relevancy is about spam, you know? <laughs> I think it's something else. Caution, caution tape, that's cool. Okay, so, and that's how search works, <laughs> okay? So we know, but we don't really know, and they really wouldn't tell us. They're privatized corporate algorithms. We can't read them the way we can read subject headings, and the way we can read classification schemes. I think Sophia Noble has done vital work on the ways that Google algorithms consistently return pornography or racial stereotypes when people search for information about black women and girls. Have people seen her talk places? She does this, like, if you haven't, go Google black girls, and you're just like, oh, we, they're fighting spam, apparently. You know, it's just like, it's not, it doesn't resonate with the problems that it produces. She challenges, Noble challenges us to think hard about the ways that information retrieval is biased the way that digital tools tell very old stories about which lives and which kinds of knowledges matter. Despite the magic of the internet and its big open feeling, the problems of information organization along hegemonic ideological lines persists, but it'll be less and less apprehendable by users like me and you. I think the next story we need to figure out how to tell each other is what ways of being and knowing algorithmic retrieval obscures. But that's a different talk and maybe one we'll have now. I'll close with that. Thank you.
We have about 15 minutes for questions, so if anybody has a question, please just put up your hand. I'll turn my chair. I'll try to get to as many people as possible. Floor is open. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, very glad we're three months into uh, my job. And um, one of the things I'm really curious about is I think my primary role right now is to kind of learn my job. It's something that's in the back of my mind all the time are some of the questions that you're raising. And what I want to know is that how do we how to sort of build those quest that question into this work in a very kind of, in a way that, that yeah, maybe that's just a question, how to build this in. Like to, to, to your teaching? Is to that... instruction and to, I mean, yeah, to start with. Sure. Yeah. Well, I guess while um, the expectations of the, the people that I'm supporting um, might be surprised by that, by that uh, component. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, right? I do think that, like, the way you think about the tools that you're teaching ha means something for how you teach them, right? So, like, a very sort of standard, normal way of, like, teaching a class, right? So what are some keywords? We'll generate them as a class, or you'll generate them in groups and go into the catalog and search, and what did you find? Like, when you're talking with, when, I t when I'm talking with students about that stuff, um, I'm always talking to them about why do you think that you can't find yourself why is your language not here? And so I think, you know, I work in a, um, a highly diverse campus. We have 75 languages in the freshman class. Most of the students test into basic writing and basic math or come underprepared for college, right? So they're very, very used to their sort of, like, ways of thinking and knowing and speaking not being reflected or resulting in a fail, right, when they come and use our systems, which is, I think, a big part of why they don't use them. And so taking that and making it, like, this is about the structure. This is a problem with the structure, right? This is a problem, this is, like, it's a translation issue that doesn't have to do with your language being wrong, but has to do with this system not being built for and by people who speak about and think about things the way you think about them. So that, like, like that's pretty didactic, and so I'm not usually that didactic, but um, it doesn't mean that I'm not, I'm never looking for the correct subject heading. I'm always looking for a range of languages and how those, how we would map them and stuff like that. So, I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I'm always like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know. You just teach your class, right? And I'm looking forward to the next couple of days to learn some like sort of innovations in teaching and, and learning in libraries. But I do think how we think about things affects how we talk about them. Yeah. It was really interesting to uh, listen to your, your um, discussion. It actually sounded a little bit more like philosophy at that point itself, especially on um, thinkers like Chuck and Judith Butler, and the notion of difference, I thought, uh, came up, especially um, in terms of how, how we use language and systems, like you said, and how um, structures are, are created like uh, through binary opp oppositions. And I think that's built in, unfortunately, into the catalog in some um, glaring ways, some telling ways. Yeah, I think the message I got from your um, discussion was that we have to be aware of that and we, we have to counteract that, counteract that in some instances when, when that comes up. Is that, am I Yeah, that? definitely, yeah. Like, I, you know, I don't, I just think it's like interesting to think about and could like think about it for a very long time. That like the whole project is about finding identity. And so if you are politically inclined or philosophically inclined to center difference instead, what would that mean? Could you build a system that centered difference? And I think, you know, people are like, well, linked open data is a system that centers difference. Are there linked open data people here? Okay, so like, I don't know, you know, if I believe that. Because I think anytime you're going to have things settle together, they have to settle together because they're alike. You know, and I don't even know how much of it is, like, it's built into catalog. I think it might be built into the Western way of seeing and knowing things, right? And so that's the real problem. It's like, since I can't even imagine a way out of it, and you've got this, like, you've got the internet now, whatever that is, and, and we still can't use it to do something that's not about putting like with like the way that, like, I decided I was going to do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, I, yeah, that's...
Any other questions? Yeah, because then I can put the link to the e-resource in my LMS or in my da 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 or over here, over there. Yeah. So, is, but is the fixity problem? Does it still exist? Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Because I'm always worried when I talk about this that like uh, it's not how we do things anymore. So like, what's the point, right? So your question is like, oh, what's the point, right? Of my 45-minute talk. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> students bringing in their own personal experiences yes. and, and I think of, thank you by the way for sharing so much of yourself with us, but I think that shows us how we approach this kind of affective way in, in which we and our students are approaching catalogs. Um, you know, is there, does that kind of ameliorate some of this power that we have if we can get rid of this things to be issue with e-resources or is it, is, is it liberating or not? So that I can move around, then it doesn't have to, the classification doesn't matter anymore. Right. Yeah, I believe what it does. I, mean, I don't know, you still have to order it somewhere. I still have to decide to put it in the LMS or, or not. And I don't know, I'm not convinced that putting it in the LMS is any different, right? Because that's just like cataloging it. Yeah, I don't know. It's a, that's interesting. I'll have to think about it. I don't know. That's fun. Hi, Emily. Um, I appreciated what you said um, about it sounded like taking the opportunity to engage students um, in conversation about this, particularly when they're running into obstacles, like I you, you talked about um, searching for um, evidence-based um, sources and, and not you know, running into obstacles, not finding what you need, and, and using that opportunity to engage the student in a conversation about the issue. And, I'm wondering um, what the response has been from students when you've talked to them about this systemic bias. I, I'm just curious, and, and maybe sharing any other examples that you've sure. used in terms of um, taking the opportunity to engage students in conversation, because I think that's really when teaching and learning is at its best, is when we engage in conversation. Yeah, so I'll get, yeah, a couple of examples. First, I, was, I happened to be a student in a class that was having a library visit recently. And um, the librarian came in and gave a presentation that was sort of um, delinked from the assignment, from the technical assignment, and was instead one of these big sort of idea sessions that I think a lot of us are trying to think more about how to do. And from the student side, I was like, why are you talking to me about that, right? Like, <laughs> I don't, you know, I'm, I'm like, or, I'm organically interested in, like, the problem of the open, right, the open access, but, like, I'm not interested in it in this context. So um, I think, like, a didactic story doesn't work. But, like, that, like, so that class thing, you know, where I'm just, how, how are the controlled terms being used? And the marijuana example is a good one because the students are always like, you smoked pot, I'm like, okay. Yeah, you know, I'm just going like, to pretend I'm knowledgeable about pot, right? Um, and having them come up with all their words and sharing their language. So any sort of example where students are, are encouraged to produce language, I think, is important. Um, a second example is I was working with a student, and this is like, like there's this, I'm, you know, the assignment was the problem, right? But the student had been assigned the con side in a classroom debate about, um, whether or not there was a link between poverty and uh, life opportunities, life chances, right? She's the con side of that. I was like, <laughs> what, right? So, you know, there's the like liaison conversation I have with a faculty member later about that assignment, but in the moment we're like, 
we had to imagine who would be the person who would have this position and what kind of language would they use to talk about it. And we eventually came up with, you know, and it's like she enjoys having that conversation because it's not like a didactic story about how systems have power, but instead it's like, wow, we really can't find anything. Why is that? It's because it turns out using the terminology personal responsibility, that's the keyword that produces that argument out of the, that retrieves it out of the thing. So that's like another example of that. Yeah. I think there's a link. Yeah. Any other Hi, Emily. Um, I have a, a, a question, sort of a broader general question about whether it really matters how, say, homosexuality is described in the Library of Congress catalog. And where I'm coming from here is thinking that it's, it's where it is under sort of deviance. Yeah. It was there in the 80s when I was a little kid. And at that time, that attitude was a direct threat to me and my family. Because, and that was the reason I had to be coached, you know, don't out mommy at work. Yeah. Whereas now, there may be some kids who have to be coached not to out their parents, but the, the reality on the ground is so different. And that's happened while that classification has stayed the same. So my question is, in the end, is how does that fit with this idea that it is consequential? Is it? And, and how? And how is it that we've had this social revolution without changing the classification? Yeah, right? Like, I don't think the library classification determines political realities or outcomes, right? Like, I'm not... Like, that would be amazing, because then we would just, like, <laughs> we would just sit down and lobby car Like, it doesn't, it doesn't, like, change things. So I think the, like, the place the, where it's consequential, the context in which it's consequential is pretty narrow, right? I think it's consequential for, and I think this is probably still true for queer kids. We'd have to ask some of them for that moment where you go and look for yourself, right? And I know that, like, probably you're not, you're not that trope where you're going to look for yourself and it says you're deviant and you have to have a, feeling about that. Like now you Google it, and I don't know if that's any better, right? Like what comes back if you Google lesbian is like probably not great. Although interestingly, my Google knows I'm a lesbian, so when I Google lesbian, it's like impossible to find porn. It's all social service agencies and like <laughs> book clubs and stuff like that. It's like impossible. It's just like really knows me well. So, um, but I think it's like in that encounter with the catalog, the frustration at not being able to find things, and then um, I mean, I think even though it's a different world on the ground, and like my kid can talk about having lesbian parents, um, and pretty openly, although the, the the amount of time he's been talking about it tells me it's not that comfortable, right? Um, otherwise, he wouldn't mention it. I think. Um, like, I think it's still there's there's still a, like a place where it's resonant for the user, and it's certainly resonant for. Yeah, I think for the user. Yeah, I think we've got time for one last question. I am interested in how that, like, you get the historical trace. So, right, like, having, a sexual de having it be in sexual deviance, like, you, you still get to keep that. Like, even if in 10 years nobody thinks it's deviant anymore, you can tell that that was at the root of, like, sort of sexual culture in the, in the 80s. Yeah. Um, a few of us were talking at lunch about, um, you know, a bit of a theory and practice divide in critical theory, and I think um, lots of people would are, you know, hungry to hear the sort of examples you gave about really practically how you can teach from a, a queer theoretical approach or frame or a feminist um, approach or frame. But I don't think that everyone necessarily feels like, well, I'm not a women's studies librarian, so I can't do that in my class, or that would be a weird fit for me. So I just wonder if, um, how you, whether you see that as being a problem. I certainly do. I, I don't know um, when we'll start to make more opportunities in our profession to you know, teach each other about how we can adopt a different pedagogy, but um, I'm just not sure if maybe I'm really one thinking this is a problem. So. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's totally a problem, right? Because like I, I gave sort of 
um, when I've talked about this topic in public before, people have been like, well, I work in the religion library, so there are no gay people there. And there's certainly not, <laughs> there's like no discussion of sexuality there. I'm like, what are you talking about? But like, I'm, I'm sensitive to that, but I also think that like, this is not, even though like, I think a queer theoretical perspective is useful, it's not because of like, the content of the question, it's because of the ways that it helps me think about the categories I'm teaching, right? And so categories are true all over the place, and thinking about ways to think and engage critically with categories is true everywhere. I also think it's interesting that it's only people who have like, that is that marked on marked thing, right? It's like the only it's only people who have a critical or political sort of view on their practice that have to talk about it in public. So more than having me talk about it, I would love to have some guy who's like not some guy, but like a person, right? <laughs> like out, of that, out of that gender thing, but someone from those categories that Sandy Berman talks about come up and try to describe the ideological approach or the ways that they think about power in the catalog and have them articulate that for us because I think it would be really useful. Because I don't think not having um, an articulated theory about your practice means you don't have one. It just means you have an inarticulate one. You know, so I'd like to hear them come and talk. I mean, not really, <laughs> right? But kind of, right? I would, in the abstract. <laughs>